family. I invite you to stand, please, for our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord, hymn number one. And we see one of all three stanzas. opportunity to be here in your presence. We ask that you would bless this place, Father. We are going to fill this place with our song, with our prayers, with our offerings, with our hearts, Lord, and we want to honor you with everything that happens here. So God, bless this day. Bless everyone who's here in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Sounds good. You may be seated. Wow. Welcome. Boy, there's nothing like an organ to just fill the place with music. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Beverly, so much for uh, that wonderful praise to, to begin our service with. I am Dave Lounsbury. I'll be your pastor for today, and I'm glad to be here. It's been a while. I was, I, I was gone last week. Why were we missing last week, Gina? Oh, because we moved. <laughs> we moved into our house. It's been about two weeks. And uh, we're getting settled, and we're really, really, really grateful to all the people that came and helped us move. Whether you helped us load up at this house, or you came and unloaded us at our new house, um, thank you so much, and uh, we greatly appreciate it. Yeah, by, by our account, we made a list. And by, by the way, we didn't get, like, thank yous out. We apologize. But we did write down everyone who came, and we had 25 people that helped us, uh, okay. including some children. So even the young people that helped. Um, I think we even included Alex Smith in that. We debated whether we should include Alex, but we did because he showed up late. But <laughs> no, it was a great thing. We've moved now twice in what, about two and a half months? Oh, but uh, hopefully not again for a while, unless it's that final move, of course. <laughs> but we appreciate once again all the love that you've shown us and the support uh, as we are continuing to transition to our new life here in Arizona. 
Special welcome to our visitors. Um, I've gotten to know a few of your names and I've been able to say hello. So very glad that you're here. Those watching online, are we all online? Everything going okay? I'm seeing a couple of look back. Okay, I got a thumbs up. You know, with technology, you never know. And, uh, but I appreciate the team working back there, making it possible for people to, to watch from home. And it's great to be in the house of the Lord. So. And I'd like to welcome our Academy kids. It's good yeah. to see you guys. Yay! And um, our visitors, Dave's parents are visiting. Um, they've been here for almost two weeks helping us get settled into our new home. Um, but welcome to all of our visitors. And we hope that you have a great Sabbath. I have a praise that I wanted to uh, share because some of you have been praying for me. I accepted a job this last week um, at a surgery center. And I start in another week. So I have another week to kind of get settled. And i um, very thankful that the Lord has given me um, a job because I've been missing being a nurse. I've just been, which is wonderful, mom and, and wife. So now I can retire. And it's uh, all well done. <laughs> Gotta make sure I remember how to do an IV and how to do charting. <laughs> but I'm excited to get back into uh, a part time. And Bailey yeah. started her new school up at Cactus Shadows. And uh, she's done very well. And we're very happy with the program they found for her. So, anyways, that's the service isn't all about us. It may feel that way, but we're just sharing a few things that are personal. And uh, we appreciate it very much. All right, well, we're going to continue on with our worship then, and Elder Mark is going to lead us in our offering call. All right. It is that time. A um, little reading here for you. I had something prepared, but George gave me this, and it, George, it was better, so thank you for helping me out there. Um, in the communist regime of Romania, a teacher felt called by God to teach in a government-run school. The all-boys boarding academy was no picnic for her. She often tried talking to the students about Jesus, but was unsuccessful. The teacher decided to pray for a venue in which God would use her to be a witness. She noticed that the students' state-provided school lunches were a bit on the light side. This observation impressed her to save a little money every month and put it in a special jar. When she would hear of a hungry student, the jar would be emptied, food would be purchased, and the student would be filled. Soon the good news got around the school body about the teacher and her lunch provisions. The teacher rented a small house next to the school building. The students often walked to her house for food during recess. This idea of feeding hungry students became a ministry for her with great success. Three of the students started listening to her stories about Jesus. They started reading the Bible and engaging in Bible studies. Two of them were baptized. Today's Impact Pacific Offering is used in the Pacific Union Territory where funds are received for unique mission opportunities that directly benefit Native peoples, refugees and immigrants, and projects responding to providential opportunities. So as the deacons step forward, and as all of the children also step forward and grab a wonderful basket up here at the front, we'll have a word of prayer. So if you are a child, please come up to the front and uh, grab one of these baskets and you can go around and for the lambs offering as well. Do we have any children? There's a few coming up here. Gotta go. don't, don't be shy, we need you. She's dragging them. There we go. We'll go ahead and pray as they're making their decisions here. Let's go our heads. Father, we thank you for blessing us today. We thank you for um, new jobs, it sounds like. Um, we give you thanks for that. That's a blessing. And uh, we thank you for the jobs that we have. The, um, provisions that you give each one of us. Um, we live in a world of abundance, um, and we're thankful that uh, we can use those things to even bless others. And uh, I would pray just that this morning as we search our hearts and uh, dig deep in our wallets on what you impress us to return back to you, that you would bless it tenfold so that your work can be done. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right. Am I on? Are there any other children who would enjoy a children's story? There is one. There is one coming. All right. Well, good morning, young people. How was your Sabbath so far? Good. My wife and I woke up really early this morning, and we went and we hiked on Sunrise Peak. It was awesome, beautiful, and nice out there. Um, I'm going to pull this down just a little bit, but I'll stay away. We're going to talk this morning about nicknames. Do any of you have a nickname? Do you mind sharing that with us? Yeah. Yeah? Sabalita. Sabalita. My brother couldn't pronounce my name like when he was a baby. So Sabalita? That's, that's been my name for my whole okay. family. Okay, okay, cool. I have some nicknames too. My sister used to call me Pigweed. Isn't that a lovely nickname? Pigweed. I, that was an endearing name that she gave me, among many others I won't repeat. Um, but nicknames are pretty cool. Because we have like a real name, and then sometimes people who are really close to us, they call us by a special name that, you know, is kind of cool. My mom calls me Marky Ben. Because my first name is Mark, and my middle name is Benjamin. And so she calls me Marky Ben. Even now, I'm 46 years old, she still calls me Marky Ben. Isn't that kind of cool? Well, did you know that Jesus also has a lot of different names? Can you think of some different names for Jesus? Rabbi, teacher, El Shaddai. Um, Jesus. Wow. Did you read my notes? No. No, that's good. You had some on there that I didn't have. Christ, right? Messiah, lion. Did you know Jesus is called a lion? And it looks like the sermon title might have something to do with a lion today, maybe, yeah, right? A lamb. a lamb as well. Michael, bread of life, bridegroom, chief cornerstone, and good shepherd. Those are some pretty cool nicknames. Do you know who else has some nicknames? Someone that we don't like very well. The enemy of Jesus. What's his name? Satan. Satan. Or the devil. Or the serpent. And he was once called Lucifer, the son of, morn of the morning. And you know, I have to say this, because last week I, I preached, and I, I went back, and I like to listen to myself afterwards to see all the dumb things I say. And I found a couple, and uh, I had accidentally called Lucifer an archangel. Who's the archangel? Do you ever hear of Michael the archangel? That's another name for Jesus. And I accidentally said Lucifer was an archangel. That, that was not true. Lucifer is called the son of the morning. So I wanted to clarify that for everybody else. And uh, so you guys know. Because it's important to call people by the right name, isn't it? It is, yeah. And, you know, especially when we're talking about Jesus and the devil, we want to make sure that we know who we're talking about with no mistake, right? And uh, so it's important to call people by the right name because that would be kind of an insult to call somebody by the wrong, the wrong name, wouldn't it? Yeah? Now, do you know that sometimes names have meanings? Do, you, do any of you know your name's meaning? You know what your name means? You want to share that with part us? Of it, part of it. Is something like Storm of God? I'm not sure. That's cool. That's a pretty cool name right there. The Storm of God. That sounds awesome. Maybe you're going to go to Thunderbird because you know we're called the Storm. You know, you I never know. I am at Thunderbird. You are at Thunderbird. Oh, okay. uh, the elementary. Yeah, that's true. Um, my name has a meaning, and I didn't know this until my dad. He had this when I was a kid. He made this little sign for my treehouse. He had it carved out of wood, and he looked up the meaning of my name. And it's Mark, and it means a mighty warrior. And as a little kid, I thought, Wow, that's pretty cool, a mighty warrior, right? Um, but it's neat to know what your, the, the meaning of your name is. So I'm going to give you guys a little assignment. Is that okay? Are you guys okay with an assignment? You're like, no, no more schoolwork. Don't worry, this will be a fun assignment. I want you to go home, and with your parents' permission, and maybe with a little bit of their help, you can do some research, and you can find out what your name means. And you might be surprised. It might, it might mean something weird, or it might mean something cool. Because nowadays, we just kind of give names based on what we like. But back in the days of uh, the Bible characters, the Hebrews especially, they gave very specific names that had meaning. So you might find a neat meaning behind your name. Isn't that cool? All right, let's pray real quick, and I'll let you back to your seats. Father in heaven, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for the many wonderful names that you have. You're a wonderful counselor. You're a good shepherd, the lion and the lamb. And uh, you are an amazing God, and we thank you for that. And Lord, you're going to give us a new name when we get to heaven. I'm excited for that day. 
And uh, you know each one of us so intimately that you know our nicknames and everything about us. And uh, we're just looking forward to developing that relationship. And I invite you as these kids look to find the meanings of their own names that they might uncover some really cool things. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. service now. Um, first song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Nobody has to stand for this one. Just stay where you are.
invite all of you up that want to participate in family prayer. DeMarc will be uh, handling that after this song. But if you want to move up for family prayer, you're welcome to do so now. Thank you. those who are able to kneel as we have prayer. Father, you are holy, holy, holy. You are our God, and we invite you to be in our presence here today. Not only here with us, but in us, Lord. We just open our hearts, and I pray that you would um, just open our minds as well as the pastor brings us the bread of life. Uh, we thank you for everyone here who was able to make it. Um, we pray for those who weren't Lord, there are many things that we have on our hearts and our minds that are, are burdens and praises and difficult situations that might arise in our, in our lives, and we just cast them all at your feet, and we give you thanks and praise for hearing and answering our prayers. Lord, I pray for the, the COVID situation and those who are affected by that, which is, to some extent, all of us. Um, we want to pray for the um, elections that are taking place, uh, things that impact our country and our individual lives, and uh, most importantly, through this, we pray that you would be uh, the center of our focus um, because we know that you have all things in, under your control. And uh, we thank you for that as well. Lord, as the church service unfolds, um, we thank you for the, the beautiful and wonderful organ music and singing that we've experienced here this morning. Uh, such an honor to be able to come into your house and worship. And we ask and invite you to continue to be a part of everything that we do with the special music, pastor sermon, and that we would be charged and empowered to go into your world and shine brightly for those who need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, thank you. Um, so I wanted to start out with just kind of giving you guys a sense of what this song really means. Um, it's called The Father's House by Corey um, Asbury, I think is what it is. So it's, it's a great one. And so 
This song reflects one simple truth, that life is not about reaching a certain goal or destination, but rather the ever-expanding art of becoming. Um, sometimes we have moments in our lives where, where we feel a deep sense of guilt or failure that we feel like defines us. Um, when that goes unchecked, it can become the very thing that we believe in makes up our, our identity. Um, and this song is all about the idea that we are not defined by those moments of shame or guilt or fear or anything else that plagues the human existence, but it is the person who put us in those moments that defines us. Zephaniah 3.17, I was going to have Jay do it, but he doesn't want to read it. So I'll read it for you. It's beautiful. Um, and it says that the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. So our, our God, Abba, is singing and dancing over us as his children, as, our, as his children, um, infusing us with a sense of freedom from the lies we have learned to believe about ourselves. Um, and in that freedom, we are stepping into an identity as children of God. So all that being said, I hope you enjoy this song, uh, The Father's House. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your grace. And my story is over, my story has just begun. And until you find me, that's what my father does. Until you won't find me, that's what my come home, the helpless find hope, love is on the move, but when the father's in the room, prison doors swing wide, the dead come to life, love is on the move, when the father's in the room, miracles take place. The cynical finds faith, and love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. The Jericho walls are quaking, the 
Thank you so much, Jess, Jay. Appreciate your, your ministry and your music. You're always welcome. And uh, again, everyone else that uh, helps with the service, uh, Miguel and Beverly and Mark, um, and uh, everyone that's helping behind the scenes, it's just a wonderful thing to be part of God's service in, in the worship uh, on the Sabbath day. Um, I'd like to pray as I begin. So uh, I know we've had lots of prayers, but if you would uh, just bow your heads with me one more time. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we uh, come to this point in the service, Lord, we, we just ask one more time for your, your blessing. We ask that your voice and your word would be powerful uh, and that that would be the motivating thing in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you know, it's interesting as you uh, put together a, a sermon, as you put together a message, and you, you look at the other elements of the church service, and you can't help but be a little biased when you, when you see how it comes together, uh, and you see ways in which it, it, it may appear coordinated, and maybe, maybe there are times when different people saw what the sermon title was or whatever, and they construct their children's story or their offering call or their special music to go along with the message. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. A lot of times it's just like the Holy Spirit was moving and just organizing everything to come together. And uh, so I, I notice things during the service because I'm always the last to come up to preach, of course, and so I'm always kind of just listening and, and noticing uh, how each aspect of the worship service develops. And sometimes I just get, you know, the, the kind of the goosebumps as I see things like, wow, that's just perfect. It goes right along with what the Lord put on my heart. The reason I say that is, and there are several things during, during the service that I could point to, but as we sang the last of our praise music, Holy, 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 um, it, uh, it struck me that that kind of goes right along with, with kind of my message today. Um, when the angels sing holy, 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 in, 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 where we get that phrase from in Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says that the thresholds of the temple trembled. Did the church tremble when we sang that? The Bible says that the seraphim that were singing that were so overcome with the holiness of God that they covered their faces with their wings. And then they covered, they had three sets of wings. If you remember, this is Isaiah chapter 6. Three sets of wings. One, they covered their faces. They, in the presence of the holy God, they had to cover their faces. You know, even God told Moses, I, I can't be with you face to face. Even these purified holy beings, angels, they covered their faces. Then with another set of their wings, it says they covered their feet. Very interesting. You could think about why that was. Well, the, you know, the feet are a symbol of dirtiness and a, a symbol of creativeness and everything. And then they flew with the third set. And Isaiah is so overcome by this vision that God gives him that he, he doesn't say, oh, that's nice. Wow, this is fun. Man, thank you, Lord. It's a great vision. No, he, he, he actually thinks he's about to die. He says, this is too much. Woe is me. I, I'm, I must be undone. I can't be seeing this. I cannot be here hearing this because I'm in the presence of this being who is so great, who is so glorious, who is so powerful, and I know who I am. I'm an unclean person. I have unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. This must be it. I must be about to perish. 
And through this, this experience, God leads Isaiah in his, in his calling, and he cleanses him, and he, he makes the proclamation, who will go for me? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Holy, holy, holy. You know, sometimes we have tamed the lion, and he is not a tame lion. Some of you may know exactly what I'm talking about by using this title, um, Not a Tame Lion, and I'll come to it in just a second. When I was uh, praying and preparing to uh, share with you this morning, so many thoughts came to my head. You may not know this, but this Sabbath today is a Sabbath that comes maybe only once in a generation. It's, this is not a normal Sabbath. Not, it's, okay, it's not just a fifth Sabbath, but it's October 31st, right? It's Halloween right? It's Halloween. Whether you like it or not, whether you celebrate it or not, whether you ignore it or not, that's what it is. It's Halloween today, all right? And about every five, six years, depending on the calendar and leap year, Halloween will fall on a Sabbath, right? But not only is it Halloween, it is the last Sabbath before a presidential election. And those two things do not coincide, but maybe once in a generation, and not only that, but this is a very controversial presidential and other uh, election. And these are just realities of our culture. Again, whether you like it or not, whether you're ignoring politics or not, whether you're totally invested in it or not, we are called to be ambassadors to our world, and we need to be aware of what's going on. So no matter how you, uh, you, you, you place yourself in the context of these issues and these, uh, uh, these holidays and things like that, um, uh, th these are the realities that are partly part of the definition of this Sabbath. And so I want to talk with you. As a matter of fact, I, I need to share with you right here at the beginning. This sermon and next week's sermons are going to be paradoxes. Okay, and the Bible is filled with paradoxes, and I love paradoxes, okay? And the Bible is just filled with them. A paradox is two seemingly contradictory things uh, that happen to be true. And you know what they are. You've heard them all the time. Uh, Jesus says, if you want to be first, then what do you got to be? Last, right? If you want to be strong, then you got to be weak, right? If, if you want to live, then you need to die. You know, you know all these. If you want to be rich, you've got to be poor. There's paradoxes all over the Bible. There's eight to ten true paradoxes in the Bible, and then through illustration and parable and psalm, there's many others. God loves to use paradoxes to teach us about His character and about ourselves. And so this sermon and next week's sermons are going to be a paradox. The reason I say that, if you don't like today's sermon, come back next week. <laughs> Maybe you'll like that one, because it's going to be the other side of the spectrum. And we learn through studying this, but today's paradox or today's presentation about a, a, a side of God's character that maybe you have not thought about in a while, maybe you have not invested yourself in, um, and I hope that it is something that touches your heart. So it does have to do with lions, though, and so I'm going to begin as I have done um, uh, pretty much since I became a pastor. I begin with a little interactive time with the kids called a kid's quiz. So just raise your hand if you want to participate. I'd love to call on you. You can shout out the answer. Uh, and we'll just see how this goes. It helps us kind of get into the, the theme of the message. Which Israelite tribe has a lion as their mascot? Do you know this one? Is it? I give you options here. Not even ask you to name all 12 of them. Levi, Judah, Benjamin, or Joseph. All right, Gabby's got it for us. Gabby, say it loud and proud. Judah. Judah. You agree with him? Yeah, that's the one that, you know, if you've studied your Bible, all you hear about the lion of the tribe of Judah. Actually, Dan and Gad also have a, a lion included in their uh, imagery. Each of the tribes had a mascot. Okay, that's all this was. It was just the mascot. It was the animal creature that kind of had attributes that they liked to define that tribe, just like the United States has a mascot. Uh, actually, we have two. Did you know that? One of them is really faded. It's the buffalo. It used to be the buffalo, but it's no longer. It's really, what is it? It's the bald eagle. That's become the more prominent. Um, and, and all countries, states have, have their animal that they use as their state animal or whatever it is. And the lion was the, um, the prominent animal in the tribe of Judah. Very interesting that a lion would be chosen for that tribe. All right. Now, next question, all about lions, of course. Who escaped from a lion or from lions in the Bible? Here's some options for you. Samson, Daniel, Paul, David. Or maybe all of them? I don't know. Yes, right here. Okay, she says Daniel. Any other guesses? 
Was that what you were going to say too, Toby? I stole your thunder. Man, oh man. Oh, you want to say another one? Okay. Oh, yeah, he says David. Any other guesses? Uh, uh, Isabel, right? Isabel. All right, she said all of the above. Oh, I don't know. Are you sure? You're right. You're right. All of the above. Now, Paul was probably metaphorical, but he does say, I escaped from the lion. Now, it may have been the lion of persecution, the lion of Rome, or uh, most commentators believe that's metaphorical, but some argue that it was a literal lion. I don't know, but all of them are delivered from lions. You know, not, not every prophet got delivered from lions. Some lions did um, kill some prophets in the Bible. Number three, true or false? Both Jesus and Satan are pictured as lions in the Bible. And, and Mark uh, kind of talked about these uh, things in his children's story. True or false? All right, Owen. Oh, say it again. He says false. You know, in these 50-50s, if it's not one, it might be the other. Maybe Anna? What do you say? Oh, she got it. That's so amazing. It's actually true. Don't feel bad, Owen, because we love to see, you know, uh, God as a lion and Jesus as a lion. But the Bible actually uses a lion to also illustrate the enemy. And that's very interesting. We can see that there are attributes that might point to each. So the last two questions have to do with that. According to 1 Peter 5, 8, what, what lion-like attributes does the devil have? And I give you some options here. He has a furry mane. Maybe on Halloween he does. I don't know. He sleeps 20 hours a day. Is that what the devil does? He just sleeps all day long. He seeks to devour the careless, or he likes to mark his territory. That's a very lion-like thing sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go with Caleb way in the back. Caleb? I heard every word, Caleb. Thank you for saying it so loud. You are right. He seeks to devour, devour the, uh, the careless. And that's what Peter says. Be on your alert for your adversary, the devil, prowls around, around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can, who he may devour. So Peter says you need to be careful because the enemy, he's like that lion. He's looking for someone not paying attention. All right, last one. I know I'm going through these kind of quick. So let's talk about Jesus now. What lion-like attributes does Jesus have? Now, he has many but uh, let's just see what we can do here. Oh, so I'm going to have a couple. So let's go with Toby. What did you say? You say he's safe, Gabby. He says he's powerful. Uh-oh, did that take it away? Any other guesses? You guys are being quiet over here. I don't know. Francine, did you have your hand up? Number two. He's dangerous. Wow. All right, right here. Uh, he's tame. And, okay, Caleb, last one. He's powerful. What lion-like attributes does Jesus have? You know, the title of the sermon is not a tame lion. That, may, that should have thrown you off on at least one of them. Now, you might say, well, I, you know, I'd like to think of, of Jesus as safe. I, I, I don't like to think of him as dangerous. Is that really the, you know, is gentle Jesus dangerous? Is that, I, I don't like to think of him as that. Powerful is okay, but dangerous? You know, when the Bible talked about the lion of the tribe of Judah, back in Genesis 49. This is one of the phrases that uh, God uses. He couches. That means he relaxes. He lies down on the couch. He lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? That's a lion yawning, by the way. He's not roaring. He's yawning, okay? How many of you want to wake up that lion? You want to you go and just give him a big hug, or you want to walk behind him and go, hey, right? You want to do that to that sleeping lion and look at that growl when he wakes up? Okay. Why does God depict the lion as an image for Jesus? And there are lots of images for Jesus, and we can we could look at them. But I want to talk about this one that he is a lion. Now, um, I want to talk about three things with you this morning. I want to talk about lions. 
I want to talk about fear, and I want to talk about Jesus, and talk about how these things all relate together. When I was growing up, I, I loved the Chronicles of Narnia. I read them the first time when I was probably about 10, maybe 11. I don't remember exactly. Um, but you know, there's something that you realize differently. When you read a book as a child, and you experience it through the eyes of a child, uh, and then you read it later as an adult, you see things differently. And that's the same for anything in life, whether it's music, movies, experiences, or whatever. Um, but I love how C.S. Lewis was trying to reach a growing secular uh, world, and he was particularly trying to help children see God. That was his whole purpose of writing the Chronicles of Narnia. He wanted children to have an accurate picture of Jesus Christ. That was his whole goal, and he uses allegory, analogy, metaphor to do it, and he uses a lion to illustrate Jesus, okay? Aslan just means lion in, in the Turkish language, and, he, and throughout the series of books, the seven books, every, every one of them, Aslan appears, and he represents Jesus, but he goes to great lengths, he goes to great lengths in his description of the lion to make sure that the children or the readers reading the book understand that he is not a teddy bear. He is not a stuffed animal. He is not a little kitty cat that crawls up in your lap. He is a lion. In, uh, in the first book that he wrote, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when the children are learning about Aslan the first time, and, and they're talking to beavers, and the beavers say, oh, everything's going to be okay because Aslan has come. The, the children say, who's Aslan? We've never heard of this guy before. And the beavers say, oh, he is a great lion. And Lucy, the youngest of them, asks the very natural question. If he's a lion, is he safe? Is he safe? And without missing a beat, without having to think of it, the beaver says, of course he's not safe. But he's good. He's the king. Now I want you just to think about that just for a second. He is not safe, but he's good. He's not safe, but he's good. Later on, when the children finally see Aslan for the first time, this is how Lewis describes it. As for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that, they cannot be, that, that a thing cannot be both good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever, had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of that golden mane, the great royal solemn overwhelming eyes, eyes, and they found that they couldn't look at him, and they went all trembly. Throughout the books, uh, Lewis tries to make it clear, when you approach Aslan, he terrifies you, but he also draws you at the same time. And he wanted the readers to understand that. Toward the end of the book, at the, um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, after the great battle is over and everything is won and everyone's celebrating, Aslan slips away. And the children ask the beavers, they say, will we ever see him again? And the beaver says, well, you never know with him. He comes and goes as he pleases. You have to remember, he's wild. He is not a tame lion. He's not tame. He's not domesticated. He's not a kitty cat. And this is one of the great criticisms of the movies that came out when they made The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, they make the, the lion Aslan, the children are climbing on him, and he's rolling over and purring and all these things. He is not portrayed the way that Lewis really wants. I think he would have rolled over in his grave if he could have, actually, and seen how he was portrayed. He wanted children to understand that Jesus Christ is both terrible and good. And good. And this is an attribute of our understanding of God that we have begun to lose. We've begun to lose. And one of the other books, and I, again, I'm not going to dwell. This isn't all about the Chronicles of Narnia. This is just an illustration for you. In one of the other books, um, again, Lewis does this throughout the series. He's trying to emphasize that when you approach Jesus Christ, when you come in the presence of God, there is a righteousness there, there is a glory there, but there's also fear. And um, um, he's describing the creation of the world, and he does that through Aslan singing. Aslan sings the world into existence, and this is a different set of children, a different story. But it says, the lion paid no attention to them. Its huge red mouth was open, but open in song, not in a snarl. It passed them so close that they could have touched its mane. They were terribly afraid that it would turn and look at them, yet in some strange way, they wished that he would. 
There's this constant tension with the character of the lion that you both fear him, but you also love him at the same time. And that was something very important in the storyline that, that Lewis wanted to try to emphasize to that generation and to anyone who would come after who were reading the stories of the Chronicles of Narnia that Jesus Christ, the God of the universe that we worship and serve, is good. Yes, he's good. He's a savior. He's a redeemer. He's righteous. But he's also a holy, reverent God. And we must keep both of these in our experience with God or we lose a fundamental aspect of what His nature is. Now, I mentioned that this is, you know, Halloween and, um, you know, Halloween is largely, to a large extent, a, a holiday that's been, been dedicated to horror and to the macabre and to terror and to fear. It doesn't always do that. You know, I did turn 40 this year. And so I can kind of say, well, back in my day, Back in my day, it was the good old days, and things were a lot better. It wasn't always dedicated to fear. I was a pirate. And I'm pretty sure that's my dad's belt going across my chest there as my swashbuckle. And my sister is a black cat. Her name's Eva. And I, these are not in order. You may not, I, see, since I'm in disguise there, you may not realize, but that's me. But, you know, you might mistake that for Superman. It's okay. Happens to the best of us. Love Superman as a kid. I don't know why I have the yellow mask on. I guess it was just part of the disguise. I guess my sister is a fairy godmother or something. I'm not really sure. You can do this when you, oh, uh, I know this is 1985. I know it's 1985. You want to know how I know it's 1985? Do you know what we're dressed up as there? Say it again. Okay. In 1985, a new children's story erupted on the scene that just kids went nuts after. It was called the Care Bears. The Care Bears. And it was perfect. You just take a hoodie and you put a little cotton ball on the top of the, and there's your ears. And you take a paper plate and you draw a heart on it or a rainbow and you tape it. You can actually see the tape. There's the tape. You tape it on your tummy because the Care Bears had these little things on their tummy. Wonderful. Wonderful. This is before Party City and stuff like that. This is before Walmart and the internet and everything. But I know that's nice. Oh, that's Milo, Selena, and Benji. They were our neighbors, uh, friends of ours when we lived there. Oh, the crayon year. Yes. Hasn't it always been your dream to dress up like a crayon? Oh, man. That was the best, to be a crayon. And I guess my sister's an old lady. That's what she is. She's an old lady. Now, I have to warn you, this next one is scary. So you may brace yourself. It's, it's, it's tough. Okay, so just, you might grit your teeth a little, maybe look between your fingers, because it, it gets a little scary. I have no idea what my sister's supposed to be. A clown, I guess? Is it Ronald McDonald? I don't know. Uh, she sent these pictures to me, by the way. I said, hey, I need pictures of when we used to dress up for Halloween. She sent these. And that's me. Uh, that's my soccer uniform, and I have clown uh, makeup on. I guess I was the weepy clown soccer player uh, superstar. That's what I was, and uh, very dramatic and uh, very important, of course. Boy, things have changed a little bit. Let me take you now to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Keep in mind, this is the love chapter. This is very important to remember. Paul is talking about love. And as he's beginning to wrap up the chapter, he says this, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, how many of you know the rest of it, I put away or I did away with childish things. Now notice he says childish things, not childlike, okay? It's perfectly fine to have childlike faith and childlike innocence and childlike creativity, all right? But he's talking about childish things. Okay, the immaturity uh, that is, is inappropriate once you have grown and learned. He says, I put these things away. Now, keep this in mind. This is a love chapter. He's talking about childish love, or excuse me, childish things that distort love. 
He says, when I became a man, I put them away. I got rid of them in my life so that I could experience a better and higher understanding of love. Okay? So it begs the question, what childish things distort love? What childish things did he have to get out of his life in order for him to experience and know love to a greater degree? Now, I'm going to take you to 1 John now. I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, but uh, please just stay with me. Here in John, 1 John, uh, the apostle says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Now, before you say amen, which I know you are all browsing to do, there was just this great amen about ready to burst through this house right now. But before you do that, Keep in mind, John is not talking about all fears of every kind. I know we love this verse. We put this on our bumper stickers, and we write it in our journals, and we do all kinds. Oh, there is no fear in love. Perfect. No fear at all. Wrong. John is clearly talking about a kind of fear. He's talking about childish fear. But we are commanded by God to fear. We are commanded by God to fear the Lord. There is always fear, a good fear, a godly fear in relationships. Worldly fear, selfish fear, sinful fear is what John is talking about here. Let me put it to you another way. Um, husbands, if you're a husband out here, uh, raise your hand if you love your wife. I'm putting you on the spot. Juliet, you love your wife. I'm glad to see that. Okay. You love your wife? Are you sure you love your wife? Now, and I ask this with all sincerity. I don't mean this tongue-in-cheek or sarcastically at all. Do you fear your wife? <laughs> I'm telling you, listen to me now. Listen to me. If you don't fear your wife, you don't love her. We could reverse this, by the way, ladies. Ladies. How many of you love your husbands? Yes, love, yeah, big daddy, love him. Do you fear him? Now, of course, we're not talking about a violent fear. We're not talking about a reckless fear. We're not talking about, a, you know, that type of thing. But we're talking about a reverential, respectful fear. You have to have fear in relationships. Fear is a motivating reality that helps us appreciate the things that are great in our lives. And to far too great of an extent, we have tried to eradicate all fear in our Christian expressions. Childish fear prevents us from knowing God and God's love, but godly fear is essential. So let's talk about godly fear just for a second. The fear of the Lord, just a few verses here. I know you've heard these before and, and they're familiar. You may have come across them with some regularity. The fear of the Lord. Notice the, the relationship between fearing God and knowledge, or fearing God and wisdom, or fearing God and understanding. Every time this phrase is found virtually, um, those two things are paired together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you want wisdom? Why are so many people lacking in wisdom? Because they don't fear the Lord. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. Now, I know that sometimes preachers and commentators and stuff, they want to like neuter down the fear of God and they'll, they'll say, well, yeah, we do need to, the Bible says we need to fear the Lord, but that just means, you know, show respect and be reverent. It doesn't really mean tremble. It doesn't really mean that God is, you know, uh, unsafe. And when God spoke to, to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai and the, and, the, and the mountain thundered and there was lightning and there was fire and the children of Israel trembled and said, Moses, we can't go near this God. You go up and talk to him. They say, well, God only did that because they were just peasant slaves. They didn't know any better. They were like children. He had to use something dramatic. But by the time we get to gentle Jesus, we become so much more knowledgeable of the things of God. And now fear becomes more of just this friendly relationship. I've probably used phrases like that from time to time. But I think it is an inaccurate, an inaccurate description of how our relationship with God should be growing and be defined. We need to fear Him with trembling because He is a holy God. 
Let me just show a couple more verses here, and then I'll explain a little bit more. The fear of the Lord. This is right at the beginning of Psalm, Psalm, or excuse me, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord, again, is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then a couple chapters later, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So if you put all these verses together, you get this, this reality. To fear the Lord is to know the Lord. And to know the Lord is to fear the Lord. He is not a teddy bear, right? He is not a stuffed animal. He is not uh, that, that just little... Now, again, I'm not trying to destroy. Like I told you, you don't like this week's sermon? We're going to talk about the paradox of the reality of the gentleness of Christ next week. But these two must be in tension. They must be in balance. If we do not fear the Lord, other fears will take its place, and they will dominate our lives. You know what a fear is? A fear is anything you give control over your life. That's what a fear is. Anything you give control over your life is a fear. And there are good fears. There are fears we need to have. Like I said, you should fear your spouse. Your spouse should have great influence in your life, right? And, and your children, we're supposed to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, right? There are all kinds of fears that we should have that are motivating, that are empowering, but there are the other side of the fears. There are the worldly fears that incapacitate us and make us weak but we shouldn't get rid of all fear. This is a description of what I would call perfect love. To fear the Lord is to know the Lord, and to know the Lord is to fear the Lord. We've gotten rid of the fear of the Lord, friends. Did your heart tremble when you walked into the presence of God this morning? Or did you yawn? When you stood up to sing the praises of the holy God, did you feel a sense of awe? Or did you look at your watch? I'm not here to criticize. I'm not here to put anyone down. I'm trying to illustrate and to draw you to the reality that a healthy knowledge and, and a relationship with God should be appropriate to who God is. He is our friend, and He is our gentle Savior, and He is the goodness and the pal and all the things that we want, but that is one side of Him, and we need to have the balance of the other side. He's our friend. But when he died on the cross, it wasn't as though a, a, a candle got blown out. The earth itself convulsed. Lightning flashed. An earthquake shook this world when Jesus died on the cross. It was not a gentle experience. And by the way, for all the gentleness of Christ that we see in the Gospels, and by the way, there are those moments that we see Christ in the Gospels where He is not gentle. When they, in, the, in the Gospel of John, when the soldiers come to arrest Jesus in the garden, and they say, are, is, are you Jesus of Nazareth? You remember this story? And Jesus says, I am. You remember what happened? By Him speaking His name, the I am, that's Yahweh. When He declared in Aramaic, Yahweh, I am, it was so powerful, it was so violent, that in that moment, everyone who came to arrest Him, it says they drew back and they fell to the ground. And Jesus was saying in that moment, you may be coming to arrest me, but you need to know who's in charge, me. And when I speak my name, you want to know what happens? You fall to the ground. Now you get right up, go ahead and come arrest me, but you just need to know that I'm the one in charge here. And you can see snippets of this all throughout, even the Gospels. But I always like to balance and say, the same Jesus that we read about that took the children in his arms and who blessed those who are suffering and did all these wonderful things. And I, those are good things. I'm not trying to dilute those at all. I'm just trying to balance them. In that same Jesus is pictured in Revelation with eyes of fire and with a sword coming out of his mouth. And his, his, his robe is dipped in blood because he's up to his hips in blood. That's the same Jesus. When we approach him, we need to see the whole aspect of him, not just the limited side that is comfortable to us. Holy, godly, spiritual fear is essential to our spiritual development and growth. To know who God is and to worship him for who he is. And here's the big point. This is a fear. It doesn't weaken us. It empowers us. It motivates us. And here it is. This fear will overcome all other fears. 
You will not be overcome with fear of Donald Trump or of Joe Biden if you truly fear the Lord. Okay? You will not be afraid of the monsters in the dark. You will not be afraid of the darkness and the ghouls and the ghosts if you fear the Lord more than anything else. That fear will be the overwhelming, dominant, empowering reality in your life. And if more people, especially in the church, really understood what it was to fear the Lord, they would not be caught up so much in the whims of the fears of this world. I fear the Lord. What do I have to be afraid of? My favorite psalm, Psalm 34, taste and see. Notice this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What did, what did um, uh, Lewis say about Aslan? He's not safe but he's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord. Wait a minute. How can he be good and me be afraid of him at the same time? It's a paradox, but that's what the Bible teaches. Fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him, there is no want. Oh, I have a lot of wants. <laughs> I have a lot of wants. You know what that means? means I need to learn to fear the Lord more because that will overwhelm other fears and other wants. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. The Lord is good. We can fear him and we will have, be in no want as we seek the Lord. There's a balance here. You know these verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I'm not going to fear anyone as long as I fear the Lord. I don't fear anybody. The God of the universe has declared me his son. What can man do to me? The Lord is the defense of my life. If the Lord is your defense, who do you dread? If you're dreading the Lord, there's no one else that needs to be dreaded. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. I will not fear these things. What can man do to me? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because I walk with the one who has all of my fears. I fear him more. Now, am I trying to say that God is scary? Am I trying to say that God is a, is a bad person? If you're hearing that, I hope that that is just erased from your thinking altogether. That is not what I'm getting at at all. I'm trying to say that as the king and sovereign and power and creator of the universe, he is worthy of our respect. He is worthy of our recognition that he is not like us. He is the glorious God of the universe. And by faith, when we walk in his presence, we see him for who he is, and our hearts shall tr should tremble. Um, there's a book called Dangerous Wonder, and I just want to give you a quick uh, snippet of that book. Dangerous Wonder is its name, and this is what the author says. His name is Mike Iaconelli. He says this, and it's a great book for, for young people to read. No fear of God, no fear of Jesus, no fear of the Holy Spirit, and as a result, we have ended up with a feel-good gospel that attracts thousands, but transforms no one. It is time for Christianity to become a place of terror again, a place where God continually has to tell us, fear not, a place where our relationship with God is not a simple belief or doctrine or theology, but a constant awareness of God's terrifying presence in our lives. The nice, non-threatening God needs to be replaced by the God whose very presence smashes our egos into dust, burns our sin into ashes, strips us naked to reveal the real person within. A healthy, childlike fear, childlike, not childish, childlike fear should make us more in awe of God than our government, our problems, our beliefs, our doctrines, our agendas, or any other earthly concern. one person thought that was okay. Our fear of God should make us more in awe of Him than any other thing, our government, our problems. Our God is perfectly capable of both calming the storm and putting us in the middle of one. Either way, if it's God's, we will be speechless, we will be trembling, and we will be smiling. 
It is time to become people whose God is big and holy and frightening and gentle and tender and ours. A God whose love frightens us into his strong and powerful arms where he dares to hold us in his terrifying loving presence. How did we end up with how did we end up so comfortable with God? Oh, when I read that it really hit me. How did we end up so comfortable with God? I don't think that should be a definition of our relationship with God at all. How would you like it if you're a wife and he says, well, um, husband, how do you like your wife? Well, I'm comfortable with her. That's not a very inspiring relationship, is it? Is that what we're going for in our relationship with God? We just want to be comfortable? How did our awe of God get reduced to a lukewarm appreciation of God? How did God become a pal instead of a heart-stopping presence? How can we think of Jesus without remembering his ground-shaking, thunder-crashing, stormy death on the cross? Why aren't we continually catching our breath and saying, this is no ordinary God? We don't worship an ordinary God. We don't worship a comfortable God. God. Typically, we would be talking about how we shouldn't fear on Halloween, how we shouldn't fear before a very controversial election, but I'm here to tell you, fear the Lord. Fear Him with love. Fear Him with admiration. Fear Him with power. And all other fears will wash away from your life. When you fear the Lord more than anything else because you know Him as your Creator and your God, He is not a tame lion. He's wild, but He's good. One more screen. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, Lord, with what limited eloquence... I have available, Father. I, I hope that honor has been done you today. And it may be a rather an orthodox thought for us that we need to tremble in your presence. Yes, we can praise and we can stand, and you are the Father that we can curl up in your lap. That is part of who you are. But we always must keep in balance the totality of your character. That when we need you to be a father, you're a father. But when we need you to be a lion, you're a lion. When we need you to be a lamb, you're a lamb. But God, help us, Father. Help us to know you. Help us to love you. And those things must include a reverential and powerful fear. Help us to fear you, Lord, that in a way that helps us grow, in a way that gives us strength and power, in a way that helps us overcome our selfishness and our sins. God, we know that you're coming soon, and we know that this world is filled with all kinds of fears. May we be the people who fears only you supremely and can be powerful and courageous in the days in which we live. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, guys. I hope that you have a wonderful day. Continue growing in your relationship with Jesus. He'll never let you down. God bless. Yeah.